This episode of Ticket Volume is brought to you by us, Invigate. Get service operations under control in no time. Get one free month of our software solution by going to try.invigate.com. Ticket Volume is proud to present an absolute legend in service management who got their start at WebMD as a technical services manager and has a range of experience from Front Range, now Avanti, Network D, Touch Paper, and Landesk before founding ServiceSphere, the first social vendor for ITSM. He's also worked at Pink Elephant, ServiceNow, BMC, Healthways, and Compassware before going independent as a consultant, author, speaker, and global personality. Our guest today is known globally as the world's most connected human. He has been featured on the cover of Business Week and as Patient Zero in the Digital Health Revolution for the Showtime documentary series Darknet and has been interviewed by The Wall Street Journal, NPR, BBC, Fox News, and Wired. Welcome to Ticket Volume, where good service is good business. We share news and information for improving IT experiences. I'm your host, Matt Barron, and I, each week I get to chat with different humans to share insights on service management, technology, and business, and this episode is going to stand out. I hope you're ready for a doozy because without this guest, there would be no ticket volume. So I also hope that you will leave a comment, connect with us, or share our podcast with someone, get involved, get us improving. And also, if you want to dig deeper into the future of work, you may want to check out Invigate Unbound, our yearly initiative that gathers some of the brightest minds in AI, IT, and the future of work. You can get early access at invigate.com slash invigate unbound, or follow the link in the description. But for now, let's begin. Welcome to Ticket Volume, Chris Dancy. Hello, Matt. <laughs> Welcome to ITS. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know, Chris put out a tweet, I don't know, two decades ago about starting an ITSM podcast, and I've never looked back. Chris introduced me to podcasting, and what an inspiration you've been to me, Chris. I greatly appreciate you being here. Thank you. I hadn't I hadn't done the intro, though. Welcome to ITSM Weekly. And gosh, oh my, 15 years? I don't know. It's been ten, at least 10. I know it's at least 10. <laughs> okay, uh, so one day. It was decade. really exciting to be. Yeah, and then the um, the algorithm on LinkedIn keeps pushing me your content. So I thought, okay, I need to listen to the digital afterlife and see how you're doing. So uh, congratulations on ticket volume. I've watched a few episodes. Your studio quality is just ridiculous. Um, and then... I don't know. I just think I want to say you've grown since we did ITSM Weekly and you started going to conferences with us all around the world. I think you're the same person. I don't think you're any more mature or polished. You've always just been literally diamond rough cut on some some girl's hand. We call attention owning all of it. So I just think it's amazing where you've gone and what you've done. And I'm so glad you stayed true to yourself and haven't looked back you know so many people still i guess in service management a lot of a lot of industries they spend all their time looking backwards so i'm really yeah. proud of you thank you so much chris that is so nice what a great way to start the episode my heart is already filled <laughs> So we're here to talk about the future of work, and I thought you'd be a great guest because you started a conference called The Future of Work, or TFW, a 24-hour conference, the first 24-hour conference to be hosted on a Google Hangout back when Google Hangouts were just beginning. And I would love to hear what you've been thinking and what you've been formulating formulating about the future of work at, in your work as, as a futurist, as a as a thinker of things, as a, as a doer of doings. So what, when you think about the future of work, like what, what comes to mind first? Because I know that you're famous for beating down the fear, uncertainty, and doubt, the FUD uh, around the future of work. So, so what comes to mind first? Is there FUD we need to fight away or is there innovation we need to think about? Where do you go first? Well, I'm absurdly uncomfortable with the concept of the future of work because I think 
both of those things don't exist anymore. I think people who are planning our future underestimate the present. Mm -hmm. And I think the people who are focusing on work underestimate living. And I don't think I would have said that 10 years ago. You know, 10 years ago, I think I would have really been focused on, you need to look at this technology or, or, or this system or consider these cultural values. But we're way past that. You know, most of the planet's either on fire or, or burning. Uh, a majority of the planet is underserved, underprivileged, malnourished, unhoused. Um, and the people who have places to call work are underpaid and underappreciated. So, you know, when you asked me to, to speak about the future of work, I was really overwhelmed because I was just like, I don't even know where to start. I think we really need to get grounded into the present reality before we can really focus on the future of work. And the present reality is there's a lot of technology, something we've been talking about literally for decades, that is helping to change and shape people, sometimes in profound and important and urgent ways, if you read my story. Um, don't unplug how technology saved my life and can save yours too. But more importantly, I think it's shaping some people in really awkward, unfortunate ways. You know, you go back to someone like Rob England, who I met in the late, you know, 20, 2000s, who was known as the IT skeptic. And again, I think skepticism has a beautiful place. But for all the things that Rob was skeptical about, they came and went anyway, mm -hmm. you know? And I think so often you know, futurists and people who ponder the important things will drum up this FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, and not really acknowledge what's important to them. Mm -hmm. And I think if you had to define the future of work in one sentence, it's bringing your values to bear in a world that desperately needs more of both. And I think that is what we're fundamentally missing at work. Who are you when you show up? And how does your work maintain your values, regardless of the tools you do, whether you're slinging hamburgers, servicing the C-suite at a Fortune 500 company, or driving a car from Uber? Oh, can I get an amen? I hope this isn't the first podcast where I cry, <laughs> but this is this is really important. This is important information because it. You know, we, we talk about supporting the whole human and we talk about mental health, but but you're right. That's really what we need to do is make room for, for people to be themselves, to bring their values to work. That is such a great place to start. Yeah. And I also think there's so many, you know, since I spoke to you last over a decade ago about work, about service management, you know, there was this big pushback then. You had, you know, thought leaders like Karen Ferris and Mark Smalley, who were really forging ahead on the cultural values that, you know, change takes in an organization. Well, the one thing we know is like, even the best change initiative with the best culture still is probably going to fail. Mm -hmm. And today it's failing because of things outside of the work. Again, the most perfect, you know, hermetically sealed environment is still people still have to drive home with road rage, drive home to sick children. To a, to a neighborhood that's falling apart where water is, you know, you know, water's stoppages because of pollutants or whatever. So I think, you know, we really need to get back to this. So, you know, culture is one of these things. But then I just look at some of the, and then after that, obviously, that birthed the whole, you know, DEI movement. You know, I think you really can't say there was a culture of work movement with that the DEI movement needed that to come for it. And the movement I'm most fascinated about today uh, that's been going on about three or four years now is this whole reclassification of how we think uh, under the guise of neurodiversity. Oh. And I think neurodiversity is the final frontier in the future of work. Because, again, no matter what you do or how you're doing it, how you think about it is really di dictates your success. Because even with, you know, uh, you know Vic is it Victor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning, you know, where he was in a concentration camp. You know, how you frame your thought where you are really dictates your outcomes. You know, in a concentration camp, he still kind of freed himself from a lot of the darkest things that he was seeing. So for me, I identify on the spectrum now um, since we last talked. Uh, I now understand that my brain, when I look at, you know, computer systems, whether I'm installing the White House or the Waffle House, you know, way back in my uh, ITSM days or speaking at a conference, it's I'm not particularly intelligent. I just rapidly put together concepts super fast. My mind looks at the world and sees a CMDB. 
My mind looks at a, a crisis and sees problem management. And my mind looks at something happening in my own house and sees an instance. And I think if you understand service management, there's really not much you can't do. But it really comes down to can you see systems and can you articulate them? The seeing a system and not articulating it will just make you angry. Yes. Oh, my gosh. White House to Waffle House. I did them both. I installed both their service desks. <laughs> that one is too good, my man. Um, yeah, yeah. I, You know, it's a spectrum. So everyone's on it. You know, whether whether you're really on the low end or really on the high end, welcome to the spectrum. You're, you're on it. And, yeah, I, I've sort of come to the same conclusion that, you know, that's why I love process design. I love control. I love boundaries. I, I understand how work can move from one place to the next. And yeah, that that really is a challenge. And, and th this is really where I think HR departments have a, a large row to hoe because they, you know, adapting to the individuals is difficult. If you start mapping people's neurodiversity or, you know, use the Kepner Trago map of change, uh, how, how willing you are to accept change, no matter what it is, they're, they're really just trying to measure people to their maximum. And then, of course, revenue <laughs> after that, right? Like measure people and then make money somehow. Yeah. Um, so that's a tough, that's a tough bridge to gap or a gap to bridge, I, I guess. Um yeah, I mean, HR, I, I still don't understand HR's purpose. In my book, uh, you know, I almost grabbed for it. Uh, you know, I have a whole chapter on what it was like for me. I always had trouble with HR. But looking back now, because when I have clients nowadays, whether it's a client where I'm going to speak at a conference or a, a client I'm actually building something for, you know, I tell them right up front, you know, I, I'm, I'm neurodiverse and it comes from a, a set of trauma that I experienced as a young person a set of trauma that I put myself through in my 20s and 30s with drugs and alcohol, or a set of trauma with re, re, you know, repairing myself from all of that and then having to figure out, well, who am I in the world if I'm not my problems? Everyone I knew from 1991 until 2011 needed me to be the set of problems I brought to the table. They didn't want me to be well because it's not, no one's, nothing's likable about a person who's well, right? But it's great. It gives great clickbait if you're just a constant drama. And, you know, being up front with people about that or just having people be able to read my story, like the actual dirt, it's not the, you know, the sound bites I'm giving you here. You have a different level of engagement with people, whether it's an HR department who's hiring me to do some consulting or a big company wants me to come in and, you know, and, and impress their people. And I think it's given me a certain level of freedom because I can say to people, listen, you know, I'm probably not going to respond in a way that's going to make everyone comfortable. But to that end, I've developed tools, accessibility to help people interface with me. So, for instance, when you're hiring me for a keynote, I have an engine I built that allows you to pick the feelings you want the audience to have, not the topics you want me to talk about. Because I do feelings really well. I, 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 can, I can turn them on and turn them off. I'm an actress. I've had all of them and all of them at once sometimes. And I can wrap a, a narrative into a feeling. So if you want me to do something on AI, it can be scary or insightful. It can be hopeful or optimistic. It can be empowering or courageous, right? I've got a, a little feeling meter. And all it is is the delivery. And what I've found is whether it's doing a keynote or working with someone and using the lights in my office to display different colors so that people know where my mood is each day, it's really helped me, I guess, get more business done because we're we're coming to work or, or to the, to the job, to the workplace with knowing where I am mentally, mm -hmm. you know, long gone are the days where the cubicle had the little sliding magnet with the 12 faces on it, where you had to figure out how someone was feeling by the magnet, if they even remember to put it in or people who walked around with the coffee cup that said, don't talk to me till this is finished. You know, today people show up with a lot of feelings all at once. And I think, it's just so important we have courageous people talking about their own personal experiences under a way that people find them approachable and say, yeah, that kind of made sense to me. I want to do what he's doing. Uh, it's just an exciting time to be fully alive. Yes. There's so many great services and products available to us to understand ourselves, you know, uh, BetterHelp is a great app if you're looking for therapy. Uh, they've got another one called Rejoin or Regain that's for couples therapy. Uh, and 
the gap that I see that I would love to see an innovative company adapt w- would be, you know, provide psychological services for your employees. You know, get rid of Strengths Finder, like you were pointing out, and instead, like, help people discover their emotional status, help people invest in themselves as part of work so that they can be healthy, so they provide the best service and support, let's say, if they're on the service desk, for example. It's interesting. I um, In 2018, when I finally got married, I developed a system for my spouse and I. My spouse isn't very much a to-doer. Like, I like organization and tasks, you know. To me, life is just a bunch of tickets that have to be closed. And, <laughs> you know, first car resolution for, you know, everything that you don't want to deal with again. But my spouse isn't wired that way. My spouse is really wired with intention. He, he has an intention to do something, make it done, may not, but there's definitely no SLA around the garbage being taken out, even though it's once a week at the same time and the <laughs> trash will smell if it doesn't. There is no actual SLA that is going to happen. So like how you create a system for someone who thinks so differently in a world where you need things done. And one of the things I did was I created this, uh, this board of sorts. And this board is built on a tool called Miro. And it allows us to come in and first look at our family's values. We have six main values that we deal with, health, home, family, work, finances, and service. And then it allows us to look back at last week and forward at the week coming. And when we look back, we we talk about the things we did well or maybe not so well or things we definitely have to change. We look forward, again, to things we want to visualize, internalize, or actualize. But then we use colored stickies. And these stickies really help us then come in and look at what area or what value that we want to actualize or internalize each week. And in doing this, it's really helped us, I think, come to a point where we can see each other through the lens of what our needs are and not so much what needs to be done. Because my need is much different than what needs to be done. My need is to be heard and understood that something's important to me and aligns. That's much different than the trash needs to be coming. Because if the trash never goes out, I'm fine. But it's nice to know that you understand that it's important that it should be. That's step one. Does that make sense the way I'm saying it? A thousand percent. Uh, the it, it's the it's the feeling behind the task. It's not a it's not a task list. It's the it's the outcomes of the task being like. Imagine a, a ticket comes in and a person says, you know, my computer is broken. That's that's a, like traditional what we hear, but really what they're what they're trying to say is I can't reach a customer whose child is dying. Yeah, you know, and and if you know that as me, a, it makes me anxious not to be able to return a phone call. Bingo. I mean, more than like I I didn't even put my needs in front of the businesses. Yes, the business needs to call this customer, but it makes me anxious if I can't. Mm. Right, and I think that's really where HR and IT, something we've talked about, the marrying of those two departments. Now that everybody is basically a walking machine, needs to really look at and like, you know, what do you need to function? You know, because gosh knows it. In my, in my, you know, here I am in my you know mid to late fifties. I'm tired by two o'clock. If I had to actually go to a job where I had to work, you know, from eight to five, I'd actually have to. I like, I lay down from two to three? You know, it's just it's a lot. You know. But I also think that aging is one of these amazing things that allows each of us to lean into the frailty and the and, and the, ephemer- the ephemerality of just y- your vitality. You know, mm-hmm. 10 years ago, like I could do a lot of stuff, right? But like today, I just can't. And my mind tells me, yeah, you can. But then my body says no. So uh, it's it's just so it's so different now that everyone is so fragile. And I, I'm I'm kind of here for it. Yeah. Yes. I'm here for it too. I feel the same way. You know, I'm in my, or I'll say early to mid forties. <laughs> We're dating this podcast, but, um, and I have less energy than before. And le- I would say less ambition because I've been slapped down enough times. No, you can't do that. No, that's not going to work. Um, but I have more wisdom and intelligence than ever before. And so hopefully, hopefully my eight hour workday that used to turn out, let's say four hours of work of, of quality work. Now I can work for four hours and it's all quality all the time. Mm. Mm. 
Yeah, you know, I remember that Tim Ferriss of the whole four hour work week and stuff. And it's again, I think there's just so many tropes around. Yeah. You know, saving time and doing things. And and on my personal journal, the one I fill out three times a day and have for like the last ten years, I have a line at the very end of it, uh, at the end of each day that I, I have to read, and it's you can't save time, you can only spend it right. Mm. You know, and I spent decades trying to save time, optimize time, do time different. You know, and for me, it's just like, it was never about the time. It was about myself. You know, so many people with ADHD will beat themselves up because they'll spend like four hours making a list. And they'll like, well, God, they got nothing done but the list. Well, the list was the purpose. You know, your brain needs to defrag, just like an old physical hard drive. And list making is a way of defragging. Your list was part of getting something done. Procrastination is part of getting something done. Things don't happen until they are supposed to happen. And you can blame yourself for that. You can shame yourself for that. Or you can go to a boss who's going to beat you up Monday through Friday for not following their such a procedure. But things are going to happen when they're supposed to happen. And I think until we kind of come to terms with ourselves and be patient with our minds, something we're going to hear a lot about in this talk, all I guess, um, we're just going to constantly suffer. And there's so much suffering we don't need to add to it toward ourselves in, you know, in that way. More amens. I've got a whiteboard over here. And the list, it, it, you're right. It def, it defrags my brain. Totally, I can finally like get this weight off my shoulders, and it's there. I, I when I need it, I can go pull from it and and get my work done. And yeah, I I struggle with that, forgiving myself for procrastinating, forgiving myself for for missing some of these things on the list, when in reality they were meant to be missed. Yeah, I mean. If something isn't missed, it, there's a reason. And if something's missed, there's a reason. I mean, that's kind of the weird thing. You know, I, I do work with a lot of organizations all over the world. Crazy stuff. I've done everything, you know, since I've stopped keynoting. I mean, I still, I'm still going to Europe in a couple months to keynote over there for a big ITSM conference. Um, but now when I help out companies, it's, you know, it's very strategic. You know, my last real job I had was the chief digital officer for a billion dollar healthcare company called Healthways. You know, we had thousands of employees all over the world. I developed an app for them called Compass. It was low friction data collection, a lot of the stuff I used to be really, really famous for. And, you know, I can still do that in my sleep now. But now when I go work in companies, I'm just so stunned. I'll be honest with you, stunned at how many companies still live inside Microsoft Outlook. Mm. They have, and even Outlook might, might even be on-prem, right? <laughs> So long gone are the days where Fred Luddy's telling me, Chris, trust me, you've got to get in the cloud, you know? And I'm like, well, the salespeople are supposed to be in the crowd. We're not supposed to be in the cloud. Now everyone in IT is in the cloud, right? Um, and, and now there are just so many companies that are just stuck. And it's weird because I think there's a bit of ageism that comes with you see corporations that have really backward processes. But at the end of the day, I think you've got your chronological age, you've got your career age, and you've got your mental age. Mm -hmm. You know, mentally, I'm 12. You know, career-wise, I'm probably in my 30s. And chronologically, I'm somewhere in my 70s, um, even though I have a physical age of, of my mid-50s. Um, but this collapse and fluidity of, of temporality that just surrounds me all the time comes from the fact that I'm a systems thinker, right? Mm -hmm. So when I'm aligning to someone else, I have to say, okay, what mood is, is, is Beth in today? How old is Beth? What skill, what career age is Beth? And then try to align all those things into a co cogent sentence that I, if I build some tool for her, she goes, oh, it just makes sense. You know, it's just, my one pinned tweet on Twitter is like, you know, your company's IT and it's a bunch of black boxes and then there's Google and there's Apple with a button. Yeah, and I do that every now and then because it's just like it's still so true the way you have to build stuff for people. <laughs> we haven't made it very far from that, have we? <laughs> No, no. I was so surprised when you asked me to be on the show because, like, I don't know if I can even talk service management anymore. But I know that there isn't anything I do that isn't based on service. Mm -hmm. Like, I'll describe it like in a very domestic way to a to someone in an audience member or, or a corporation. But inside, I can do the translation as if I'm still a pink elephant. And Troy, uh, I can't remember Troy's last Troy Dumoulin. Troy, yeah, Troy Dumoulin is you know whispering in my ear like a little I tell devil like what to say you know and over here I've got you know Karen Fair is telling me how to say it and somewhere in back I've got Rob England telling me nothing's gonna work <laughs> or some a vendor screaming it doesn't matter what any of them say because if you don't have this tool it's never going to happen right 
And at the end of the day, I just go, okay, just do what I said. You know, I don't say it happens. <laughs> <honest, but, laughs> <laughs> but it is weird. So then where it's coming about that is, you know, the other thing that aging has allowed me to do is just allow some things to burn. Yeah. It's like, okay, I'm not even going to try to save the situation. It'll be best when all the energy is burned out of these people and they come crawling for the solution I gave them months ago. Yeah. Like, oh, sure. You know, here it is. <laughs> we talked about this. <laughs> um, because my favorite saying at the, end, at the end of every day is you can't save your ass and your face at the same time. And everybody will always try to do both. <laughs> Oh, you heard it on ticket volume first. <laughs> that is the one to save forever. <laughs> that is such a good one. <laughs> I, I knew you would bring the heat here, Chris. Thank you so much. Um, okay. <laughs> so I, I want to hear just a little bit more about what what technology has got your attention recently. Um, everyone... It, if you had a dime for t for every time someone typed or said AI, we'd all be billionaires. Um, but what has really got your attention? What what do you think is going to push individuals, teams, companies to the to the next level? Yeah, obviously, I think AI is a big role. Um, but when I think about, to me, I I can't really say what's next until I kind of, you know, say, well, where have we come from? Because I think a lot of times, you know, we don't really think about historically what's happened. You know, one of the things I like to share when I'm doing presentations is this concept of where we've come from. So, you know, you go back to the 80s with like box software and how box software kind of ran the world, right? You know, and IT didn't have a lot to do, but walk up to your office, right? And install the box software. Make sure that you're you know, your mouse was, you know, functioning and your 14 inch wow. monitor wasn't, you know, steering a hole through your retina. <laughs> you know, you get to the 90s and the single purpose box software turns into suites and connected networks, right? Then IT had a little bit more to do. They had to like map and plan, okay, we've got a server here. We need, a, you know, a, an actually a network cable over to this other building on a T1, right? So all of a sudden, like I said, there's a little bit of planning involved with walking to people's desks. You fast forward into two thousand, you've got people saying, "Hey, cloud, cloud, you know, we can get rid of all the servers." And you know, of course, then you've got the rise of security. Like we never even talked about security in the nineties. It was just security was putting glue in the USB port so someone <laughs> didn't plug in a, a you know a non approved mouse or keyboard, right? Yep. So you know, cloud took us from all this kind of work in IT and, and kind of moved it up to like the twenty tens. And of course, you've got mobile and API everything and. 15 years ago was mobile and API. You need, we needed an app. I remember Fred Luddy and us discussing, like, we don't need a, we don't need a mobile app. I still don't even know service now has a mobile app. Uh, but then BMC hired me and we said, build us an app. So we built a location aware app for service. So you were someplace that knew contextually where you were. And just APIs and how things connected together. We were so super important. Going to the 2020s where we are now, you know, the two big movements are, you know, one is no code, which we used to call WYSIWYG. What you see is what you get. Right. All service management software, in my experience, has been no code. Like you wanted to work a certain way, so you just add fields like service management was doing no code before there was a whole movement around it, except we just locked it in IT to a certain set of people who couldn't actually talk to people with any real skill. So we created forms to do the talking for us. And we went home and wondered why our relationships fell apart when we when our spouses couldn't fill out a form to like get us to take out the trash, which we covered <laughs> earlier in this conversation. But on the side of that, we got AI, right? So no code really did for data what AI is now doing for everything. So up until this mm -hmm. point, it was all this, you know, control, all this kind of access points. It was all this kind of ease of use. No code really made all of that come together. And the AI is kind of making sense of it all. Like, where do we head next? Like, what would be the next logical thing? The next logical thing, in, in, in my opinion, is something I've been saying since 2008, and that's what does life look like when there's no physical interface? IT and, and most of work today is hell bent on controlling things they can see. But if there's one truism I know in my 35 years in IT, it's that there is no interface. Mm -hmm. Every time you give me an interface, you pull it away. You gave me box software, then it became suites of software on CDs. You gave me suites, then you then it became cloud. You gave me cloud, then it evaporated and went to mobile. You gave me mobile, then you said build your own app. You said build your own app, now you said build your own interface and way of communicating with AI. So the, the eventuality that we're talking about here is what I call adaptive platforms. 
whether they're wearable computing, you know, such as the smart glasses, earbuds, alternative re realities. You know, Stephen Mann was a pioneer in this, uh, you know, cyborg grandfather number one. Uh, or wearable computing using haptics. It's, the interface is touching you, listening to you, talking to you, but it's not something you're staring at, pointing at, right? Mm -hmm. And I think what, what once we realize that this is driving complexity down, this is driving costs down, we'll start to say, we need to start to manage people differently. You know, when you just think about me today, whether it's a jacket hanging on the back of my chair here, which has sensors in the sleeves or the glasses I wear when I go outside, everything is informing them about the world around me. And this historically is just driving the interface and the user closer and closer together. Mm -hmm. In the 70s, when I started out high school, you needed cards to program a computer. By the 90s, you just needed hardware and a screen. By the 2010s, you just needed the screen. By the 2020s, you're wearing the screen. And by the 2030s, you are the screen. Right. And I think what people, if they could get their head around this, that this lack of an interface moving forward and how you manage that goes back to the brain, something that started this talk about, is really what's going to be super important. And that's kind of where my story picked up in 2008 when I had this epiphany that, you know, hey, this is really not about how bad I had become because my technology knew so much about me in 2008 uh, when I turned 40 and I was 320 pounds chain smoking and out. But it was how do I create an interface back to me to show me who I really am? You know, the, 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 black mirror of yourself. And I think people are slowly waking up to, you know, it's not the data exhaust and a privacy and all this other scare tactics. You're lazy. If you are producing this much volume in the world and data and you're not taking advantage of it, you're lazy. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're using AI to write emails and you're not asking AI, how could I phrase this better? Or do I sound like I'm having a bad day? You're being lazy. Every time you interact with a piece of technology, you have the chance to learn as much as you can about yourself as the task you're doing. And I think people miss that. You know, when you when your phone is off, it's literally a screen where you can see yourself, right? But you turn it on and you disappear. I know people whose entire friendships are defined by how they interact with other people online. They've become the reaction to the relationship they used to cherish mm. and, and and relationships need synchronous not asynchronous right you know if i leave you a message you come back you know slack has probably ruined more companies than it's helped you know <laughs> people need to, to to actually have some sort of relationship with that so yeah. again understanding the interface is going away and what we're left with are the conditions and reactions that the that technology is informing us to do and from there we can build on the future work Yes. Oh my gosh. What a great way to end. Crystal, I want to thank you so much for joining me on Ticket Volume today. How can people connect with you? Where do they find you? I think I know the answer, but I can't wait to hear you say it. I mean, just, I, I like people just call me. You know, my phone number is 720 936 9192 plus one if you're not in the United States. I pick up my phone multiple times a day my spouse will tell you my friends and locals will tell you i i take phone calls from strangers all the time i love talking to people real-time communication is the most important thing i can do for my mental health being there when someone needs me the phone's got this really cool feature if i'm busy i just don't pick up yeah it's this thing called yeah it's i don't know i mean i saw people who text me to see if it's okay to call um as, as if there's some fundamental function that's not on the phone anymore like not picking it up um but I, I just seriously, you can give me a shout. If you want to email, you can email, but I hate email. It's passive aggressive and rude. And anybody who emails or replies to all needs to be fired immediately. <laughs> um, and that's about it. I'm excited to have been here. And if you haven't seen me in I don't know, 10, 15 years in service management, I'm still here. Doing <laughs> we are good. glad. We are so glad you're still here. Thank you so much. Thanks for your time today, Chris. No problem. And if you like this episode, then you're going to love April's web live webinar. Gene Kim will be with us live discussing how to prepare your team for the future so you can ask him questions and get insight into his new book, Wiring the Winning Organization, written in conjunction with Steven Spear. Register for free at ticketvolume.com and also get a free map of IT tools to enhance your IT support offering. The link is in the description below. Thank you for listening to Ticket Volume. 
You can change and improve this podcast by DMing me or leaving a comment or just putting it on the internet. I'll probably see it. And speaking of ticket volume, did you know that this podcast is brought to you by Invigate? It's a fit for purpose service desk solution with integrated asset management designed to let you focus on supporting your organization without arduous implementations. In fact, IT teams from Toyota, NASA, and McDonald's use Invigate to manage requests, automate workflows, and centralize inventory data so that they can focus on delivering better service because good service is good business. 